All right, everyone, welcome to our e-learning event today. Uh, my name is Amanda Demmer. I'm the Program Coordinator for Community-Based Research Canada, and I'm the moderator for today's session. Uh, today in our Moving the Dial series, we are going to hear about a project that has advanced housing affordability and advocacy from uh, Salome Amadi at Humber College. Uh, one of my colleagues, Sarah Dar, is here to support us today. If you're having any technical issues, you can uh, send her a message in the chat. She'll be able to support us. You are able to uh, turn on closed captioning for the event today if you would like. We are also recording this event today, um, just the first part of it where we talk about uh, or where we share the presentation from, from Salome. This presentation is brought to you by Community-Based Research Canada. Uh, our secretariat is located on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples here in uh, what's known as Waterloo, Ontario. We are a membership-based organization whose mission is to advance community-based research excellence in Canada by strengthening partnerships, building capacity, mobilizing knowledge, and championing community-based research among individuals, communities, and institutions. We are a social enterprise. We're funded by a network of about 50 institutional members. And as part of the programs we provide to our members, we host events like these webinar and live discussions, as well as bi-monthly community of practices. You can find more information on our upcoming events, as well as recordings of past e-learning events uh, and infographics that summarize various live discussions on our website. And Sarah is going to share this um, link in the chat with you now to where you can find that information. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we open each one of our e-learning events by reflecting on and amplifying the goals of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. Uh, this month, we're discussing uh, housing affordability um, and advocacy, uh, so I wanted to highlight call to action number nine. Uh, we call upon the federal governments to prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding for the education of First Nations children on and off reserves, as well as educational and income attainments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal peoples. Um, I thought this was an appropriate call to action as we're talking about housing affordability and, and income uh, may play into that. CBR Canada is committed to continual reflection on the interconnections between truth and reconciliation and the various topics we approach using community-based research. We're also committed to engaging with and learning from diverse Indigenous peoples across Canada. So for today's event, um, after uh, I conclude this, this brief opening, I'll pass things over to our presenter to um, share a webinar with us today. We'll have a short question and answer period after that where you're welcome to ask any questions of our speaker. Um, you can ask questions anytime uh, throughout the presentation by entering them into the chat box. Uh, that's also how you can ask your questions when we get to the question and answer period. So at any point, if something pops into your mind that you'd like to ask uh, our presenter, feel free to type it in the chat box. And when we get to the question and answer period, I'll take a look through the chat to see what questions have come up and I'll, I'll begin to read those uh, and ask them to our presenter. The webinar portion will be recorded and posted on our website for those who might want to view it or share it with their networks later. Um, after that webinar portion, we get into the very exciting live discussion. This is the chance for all of us to unmute ourselves, turn our cameras on, uh, to connect, to, to network, to share ideas. Um, and there are two specific discussion questions our presenter has given us for today that will guide our discussion in, in the live discussions. Uh, we do not record that portion. That's a chance for us just to share some insights. But what we will do is take notes during that section uh, so that we can create a visual summary of any of the insights or, or thoughts that come out of that discussion. This will be shared with all attendees of the event, the presenter, and it'll be shared on our website uh, for distribution to our further network as well. We ask that uh, for the webinar portion, you please keep yourself uh, muted. And in the live discussion, that's when we can, can unmute and chat. Um, then we'll have a kind of a brief conclusion and closing to the event after the live discussion portion. So I'm very honored to be introducing today's speaker, uh, Salome Amadi, who is an instructor and researcher in the Faculty of Social and Community Services at Humber College here in Ontario. Um, I will pass it over to you, uh, Salome, uh, to get started on our webinar. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, we can dive right in. Um, let's do just a quick little icebreaker. 
um, if you want in the chat box, maybe you can share um, how much was rent when you first, your very first time you rented, how much did you pay rent? First time you moved out, maybe living with roommates, maybe a rooming house, how much was your rent? A good variety, 395, 550, 100, 400, 1439 for a studio in Ottawa, 525, 800. Um, is that 1300 yen? 100 for a room, 450 for a housing, student housing, 1010. Yeah, 500. So the, I think um, we know that the, that the rent is quite different today. <laughs> so I won't go into the specifics of that, but it's interesting to see how far um, the changes have come, right? With housing, both the rent and costs. So thank you for that. I think sometimes we don't realize um, the big change. All right, we can go to the next slide. I think my first one was maybe 700. Um, and that was in London, Ontario at Western. So, so the South Etobicoke Housing Affordability Study, um, we partnered with LAMP and I'll talk about kind of the background of it as well. So I, I teach at Humber and at Sheridan, a variety of programs, um, community development, SSW, CYC, police foundations. Um, and so LAMP is, LAMP Community Health Center in South Etobicoke is well known and I used to be a youth who attended there. So I have roots in the community, one of the strengths of the study. Um, and so we were, um, I wrote the grant through NSERC. I saw it through my emails. I read my emails. <laughs> and so I put together the proposal and that was the first year with the CSIF um, Community College Collaboration um, Fund. And that was, we were lucky because now they've limited the number of um, grants that can apply. Um, and so um, I was one of, I think, 14 that we, that received it. Um, and so we're looking at uncovering the cost of living issues through community-based participatory research. If anyone has done that or is interested in that, please feel free to drop that in the chat box. And a community of practice, which is kind of a fancy word for what communities already do. <laughs> but we'll talk about the challenges with establishing a community of practice, uh, which overlaps with a little bit of the siloed mentality and siloed thinking. And so we really just wanted to uh, um, gauge and capture a baseline through primary and secondary data to find that localized um, information. What are what's happening? What are the, what, what are the facts, demographics? And um, also, we also asked, what are the solutions? What are this? What are this? What do community members and residents imagine are solutions? And we'll chat about that next. So just a quick snapshot of um, the timeline. So it's a three-year grant and we finished. And so we're kind of in dissemination mode and we'll be, um, um, this is one of the uh, wonderful opportunities. So we did a bit of an environmental scan and this was all part-time. So I was not, uh, you know, it's, that's always the luxury, right? To have a full-time research, um, but we did have a great team as well. So just an environmental scan and there's a lot of those who follow either housing or just advocacy and community in general, a lot has changed in three years. Um, so policies were changing. Um, obviously, housing affordability has the conversation has always existed, but it's definitely uh, has a huge spotlight on it now more than ever, um, especially with impacts of COVID. So environmental scan, um, definitional consist inconsistencies was a big one that um, I highlighted as well. And now the city has taken a income-based approach as opposed to a market-based approach. So when you're figuring out, you know, your research and definitions, I, the general tendency that I followed was very much being um, flexible and open to changes, right? Not, I think in academia, we tend to think everything's kind of static and defined and owned and, and that kind of piece, right? From a systems of um, academic systems of view. So that being flexible with that um, and adapting to real time is that bridge we need to make between theory and practice. And so because I worked in nonprofit for many years prior to, I was able, I'm able to better br bridge that gap and, and um, what I can also contribute teaching to students as well. So the community-based research, we had an advisory group help us define um, uh, and create the questions for the surveys and focus groups as well. Um, and so we kind of went 
through meetings and and iterated and discussed you know what did we want to find this is kind of the environmental scan we've we've looked at presenting that information right because as academics we can consolidate and explain um, information ask them what information they need and um, help everyone come to the table um, in a kind of common um, format and then we did data collection. We were lucky enough to, you know, be outside and 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 uh, interact with people during COVID, you know, social distancing with masks and all of that. But being around people in the community and specifically, you know, the churches, um, the food banks, the community centers. I grew up in the neighborhood, so I know it very well. And some of our team members also, um, and Lamp, of course. Then we just did a bit of an analysis and report back. Um, and then disseminating the results. We did, uh, we hosted a housing conference and um, one of the um, ideas that a community member brought to the table was how can we bring everyone together to come up with a vision for South Etobicoke, right? Because uh, if, if you're, if anyone is from, you know, Toronto or any other respective city, you kind of know the pockets of neighborhoods that are, you know, very mobilized on, a, on, a, on specific issues and um, are really vocal. And we have great work across many neighborhoods, but what is that shared vision, right? Because everyone has their kind of own self-interest, their own resources and availability. So um, the housing conference is one platform to continue bringing people together. So I think that's important too, right? And where community ex both exists, but is also being co-defined and recreated, right? On an ongoing basis. And hopefully from our lenses, decolonization, anti-O, community-based, they are the experts of their lived experience. They are knowledgeable. They are co-researchers, right? They are participating as equals to us and we're not you know, above them in that power dynamic. Next slide. Um, so I kind of hinted at this, the, the, the strengths of um, maybe a more successful community-based approach, uh, research uh, approach. Um, I lived and grew up in the neighborhood and the community for over a decade. Um, I teach at the local college. And so I was part of the community advocacy group before I uh, read and applied for the grant. And so I was part of that. I, I attended the workshops and we were learning from other um, groups across Toronto, um, Kensington, Parkdale, we were learning from other activists and organizers. Um, so I was very much embedded in the community. That's not always possible. And I realized that, and I think that's one of the challenges, right? I think when I used to work, I used to work in Rexdale, I would get a lot of, uh, you know, masters and PhD students asking me to research in our community. Can I do a survey? Can I come out? But they had no relationship, no connection, no advocacy piece. And so I would often say no, because communities are, you know, fatigued and and we're just kind of helicoptering in oftentimes, right? And leaving. And I know there's that shift in that expectation now with research and obviously community-based participatory research kind of tries to close that divide. Relationship with partner, LAMP community was strong. They're recognizable in the community as well. And then we used um, uh, that framework to create advisory groups, one for the data collection, one for the conference. Next slide. So the surveys we gathered, these are some of the, this is some of the data that I collected. I won't go through all of it in detail and there's lots more, um, but I'll just go, I'll, and I might kind of breeze through some of them, but we collected over 255 surveys. I think there's another click with a animation. <laughs> Um, 277 surveys across, you can see, in the neighborhood, um, which is which is good. It's a good representation representation because there are different income groups across South Etobicoke. We did South of Queensway, our kind of inclusion exclusion criteria, those who can rent, um, and so you can see the little pin drops there. Next slide. Um, I'll, I'll forward the full report, but um, these are just some of the highlights of why South Etobicoke. Our population growth has grown at four times the rate of the city, and we really haven't seen any um, housing affordability being built. We do have a new city councillor. Um, you know, we have over 50,000 new units slated to be built, um, so the rates of development are very high. And in our survey, we found 74% um, are spending more than 30% of their income on shelter which the city, it's about 47%. And um, 
the number one issue is uh, renters needing repairs. So spending more than 30% of your income is considered not affordable, the, the provincial and federal definition, right? And, and the issue is both that obviously lower income folks are spending more because their income is less, but that now that kind of missing middle, it's hidden because more and more people are spending more on rent. Um, and that definition is before tax income. So, but in reality, we only spend what we have. So it should be after tax median income, which is a far, it's about, you know, $30,000 less. If you look at Stats Canada, the census. So those details are important when you're advocating because there isn't a shared language then it just becomes this divisive developers define it as you know we have to pay for all the supply and demand and and you know getting our our lenders and and investors etc whereas for from a human rights perspective from from uh, those who are living it every day it's different as well so there is that and i think we can provide power to that and just kind of backing to that um when we're navigating any specific type of hallway. Next slide. Um, some more findings. Um, I think I mentioned this, um, so we can't guess it, but ne uh, if you click one more. So this is that definition. If, if folks are wondering, what do we mean by affordable? And we're not redefining it, I think sometimes um, you hear deeply affordable and, and, you know, housing should be a human right. Housing should just be able, we shouldn't have to worry about that, right? If it's a place of uh, belonging, you're, if you're having to uh, pick up and pack up and leave your community where your networks and your neighbors and your friends or your family are, that is, we're not just talking about a roof over someone's head, right? And we're talking about the social determinants of health. We're talking about the holistic well-being we're talking about long-term health policy we're talking about long-term social policy so obviously some people are a little more short-sighted and that can be a challenge too with the work we do but you must be very clear about um, how you're defining and, and conveying that message as well um, next slide um, so of our respondents 88 percent make uh, less than what's affordable in terms of uh, market rent in south etobicoke um, 70, 000, you must make a minimum of 70,000, uh, just to afford rent only. So sometimes you see the numbers are different. Um, so like you see, you have to make 130,000 to live downtown Toronto. They, when you look at what they've added in, they've added like a couple of thousand for entertainment and other things. Um, and obviously it just differs with, with expenditures and expenses, but, um, so having that definition be clear as well obviously the situation is dire for 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 many more and and i mentioned the issue with that preliminary um definition of affordability where it's where it's before average before tax income household income next slide um so i think the previous slide the number i hadn't updated it because the numbers are constantly changing so i had to update my numbers i think almost every year and so even that is a different conversation, right? For policymakers um, and, and coincidentally enough, you know, some of our political representatives who previously did not take it so seriously are now taking it more seriously because we're not just talking about the, the most um, marginalized groups, but now we're also talking about one point half of the city, one, about 1.5 million people rent in Toronto and half of them are spending more than 30% of their income on rent. So the hidden cost of health and well-being there is is much greater, right? So so this is again only for for rent. Um, next slide. And I mentioned that definition piece. So I'm looking at the median household after tax income, which you can see we don't actually make enough, right? So I think that if if we're looking at the average before, that's a big jump. And so we only spend the money we make. So even those small pieces are quite, even, even from an academic standpoint, they're overlooked from policymakers. So somebody has to speak on it, right? So if you find that, um, it, even if that definition has been defined by somebody else, I think we, can, we know that's not something that we necessarily have to follow. We can question and critique um, the status quo. Next slide. Um, and this is just uh, with our study, rent reported as, greater than 30% of income, you can see on the left-hand side, the income brackets, less than 10,000, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. 
and the yellow bars, obviously, they're spending way more, right? Those with lower incomes spend way more because they have to spend a larger portion because rent for everybody is ridiculous, right? It's skyrocketed. And then obviously those who have higher incomes, they're spending less of their total income. Next. Um, another interesting thing I think that's important that your studies uh, might find or even in your um, um, secondary research. Um, so those who live the longest have twice the number of issues and oftentimes they're being paid and bought out and leaving, right? Um, and so that's interesting. So if, if, if more people leave, then we're gonna lose those stories as well, right? In, in terms of data, if we're, because if we're, we know there's gonna be more studies, like let's go into this community and gather data that already exists, right? We tend to over study and, and, and constantly wait for more data. Um, and so obviously those who've been here less, they've been born into the situation and they think that's what it is. We, we saw, we heard someone who was living in Humber Bay, 3000 for one bedroom. They were young and, and they were not making more than six figures. So that's interesting, right? I think they just ex ex accept it as is. And that was gonna kind of tie into uh, one of our questions later on, right? I think, how do we mobilize and engage folks who think they, th things are the way that, that they are? Next slide. Oop, it jumped back. Um, another one, if you're, when you're ask, asking questions, this one was not intentional, but it did uh, produce an interesting result. So the first question we asked was, uh, are, are, I'm noticing that Salome is frozen on my screen. Um, I'm wondering if she it looks like she is for others you, as well. You there might be some technical difficulties. On affordability. And so even those who said no, if this, but then when we specifically said affordability, both side, both sometimes people are not always aware of the of issues. Do you, and the first one was so to not, here's our list. And then you check off, you know, like. Salome, you were yeah. frozen for a short period of time there, mm -hmm. uh, and we may have missed some of what you were speaking to on this slide. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Am I okay now? Yes, it's great now. Okay. For the did I did we catch the follow up question or where did I? We we caught the tail end of what you were saying there, but missed the the first part. Okay. Of what made so this, this these findings interesting. Okay, thank you. This question, um, when you're asking questions, it's good to ask, um, and this was not intentional, so you can learn from us. Um, we asked a first question just un un in an unbiased way, are you facing any personal issues? And then we had an exhaustive list and we would, if someone, if they said yes, we would read through the list and it was repairs, a bunch of things, right? Underhoused, overhoused, and that was that we gathered from other surveys. Um, uh, affordability, you know, safety, a bunch of things. So those who said yes in the yellow, those who said no in the yellow. And then we had a follow-up question that was specific to are you facing unaffordability? And you can see that even when they said no issues, the follow-up questions, the no's increased. So that's interesting, right? So sometimes the issues might be lost in how or what we ask, or people might be hesitant, or they might not realize it, or they'd need to digest it, whatever the case may be. So if you are trying to uncover something, obviously, you know, interviews, et cetera, more detailed uh, qualitative pieces can gather more, more info information. But in this case, because we did a, a 10 question uh, survey, we wanted it, we wanted to be able to, you know, um, optimize the questions and the information that we're gathering. So this was, um, Good information. Next slide. And these are just the top three issues. This is the list for, from that question. So the first one is repairs needed, the rent price is high, and then security. Just uh, unsure of if they're going to be living there longer, unsure if they can afford it. And then all the way down, um, conflict with landlord, etc. utility prices. Next slide. So this was, uh, this is an interesting table. It's lots of information. Um, 
this was something that our partner also requested us to kind of do. And I've, I've had to modify it as rent has changed over, you know, three years um, tremendously. So this is looking at Etobicoke Lakeshore only. Um, so the numbers, you'll see that they're slightly different for Toronto. So like a one bedroom now is I think 2,400 in Toronto, which is, which is, you know, if you look at, um, we have the columns in the black, uh, sorry, in the row in the black is the median rent in Toronto. And then the median rent in South Etobicoke is in the orange. And so where it starts to get affordable at the bottom, if you go down the column, you can see on the left, left-hand side, we have the income, household income um under 10,000 10 to 20 and so on and then we have in the in the second column the monthly affordable range where you're spending less than 30 percent of your income what rent should be so if you're if your household income is less than 10,000 you should be spending about 250 for rent and so on so this is advocating for rent geared to income which is not you know we don't have that uh for everybody and so that's an advocacy piece and you can see that if you wanted to afford, you know, a two bedroom or, or one bedroom, you have to be making more than 90,000 and above, according to that 30% income range. Um, and then we have on the far right in the kind of blue area, proportion of Toronto households after tax income, how much, what percentage of Toronto is earning that much? Okay, so you can see the percentage. There's 2016. And then we have 2021. Um, you can see that obviously we have a, a decrease. So an increase in income groups making more, um, which is good, but still, I mean, a majority of folks are still, you know, unable to afford the current market rent, rent rate. Next slide. And of course, uh, folks who are most marginalized and in need, you know, you can't survive off of two, $2 a day. Um, and so we've done these kind of snapshots. We have an Instagram, we've done um, a lot of educational pieces too. Like um, there's definitely a lot of nimbyism. I think I have a slide later on, but um, a lot of misinformation. P folks definitely still don't quite understand what's what. Um, so there's a little bit of education there at, simultaneously. Um, you know, if, if we increase social housing or if we increase affordable housing, does that lead to more crime and, and other things as the property values decrease or we have too much social housing? So there's a lot of um, misinformation out there and, and you know, stereotypes and, and prejudice there. So, you know, this is definitely not enough if you're only making 1169 on income and only a portion of that can go to rent too, right? It's not all of it. And so, you know, what about all the expenses? And these are just kind of conservative estimates, the Toronto Nutritious Food Basket Calculator. I think, you know, with food, it has increased as well. And another important thing that we highlighted, which we should always do in tandem is, what is the ideal um, ask, right? So the holistic ideal ask um, is not just, again, shelter, but we, we look to the Wellesley Institute's um, thriving in a city um, framework. So what about all the things that should be the baseline, that should be the expectation, food and nutrition, adequate shelter, physical activity, transportation, health care, personal care and hygiene, education and professional development, social participation, savings and debt and child care, and obviously other non-food items. So we shouldn't be asking for the bare minimum. Next slide. This is uh, this is not our this is not our data, but I think it's important because it uh, boosts our our um, everybody's story around affordi affordability. And I think sometimes we, I don't know if I, it's just me that I've read. You know, sometimes we we don't always share other people's information and research, right? So this is not done by academics, but it is um, a website that looks at rent evictions above guideline increases and own use evictions. So oftentimes these are done in bad faith by landlords so that they can remove tenants or pay them off um, and then double, triple the rent. And we hear more and more people share that. So this website, rent evictions, I think it's .com, .com. You can go and populate it with an address if you've experienced that. Next slide. So this is South Etobicoke. And then this was November. So even over the course of four months, as more people become aware and they're um, voicing it, more people are populating just to inform everybody, right? What's happening. And this is community grassroots data gathering, right? So they're not waiting for the academics, they're not waiting for the policymakers to, to, to find funding to support 
uh, finding out how dire the situation is. Next slide. And this is Toronto. Okay, so they have also a fulsome report on above guideline increases, which also has a lot of information for homeowners. So there's this story that's being weaved across all you know housing topics because sometimes it can be divided in that way too so if people want to be saving for home ownership you know because of the above guideline increases over the course of 10 20 years they're actually unable because now they're paying twice the rent unable to save the 60,000 30,000 maybe with a partner for their down payment so you know it's putting setting people up already for failure right and so there's that story that I thought was interesting because I've had folks kind of bring up the comment about housing afford um, ownership, but we, we only focus on rent. So I could guide them to this. Some challenges. Next slide. Um, so using true community based participatory research can be uh, challenging for some of the reasons I mentioned and, um, you know, different players having different ways of doing things. Um, and that goes to um, different interests, different community groups, um, different people prioritizing different things. So you have to kind of uh, be the the um, the diplomatic person to bring everyone together or to push for that. You know, let's get feedback from everybody. Let's um, ensure that the community who's involved has a say. The siloed work. There's a lot of great groups across South Etobicoke in the city, and sometimes we need to bring folks together in ways that they want to. And sometimes that that's not always the case, right? Um, and we know that siloed work is deeply entrenched in acad academia. Um, and so our systems and processes and different departments are very isolated from others. And you can be a conduit for connecting some of those dots, right? Relationships, empathy, sharing information. And that requires you to kind of unlearn your own um, mirrored systems of oppression and competition and et cetera, right? So some of your value systems, they might have to be looked at as well because we tend to operate within the institutions that we participate in, unless you have a very strong um, internal compass about what you want to do and, and how you want to support the work. Um, uh, community engagement can be better as always, right? Whether it's outreach, you know, whether a community advisory person can't come every week, um, it's a little difficult. I think people are comfortable meeting online and we want to, we, we kind of desire to be in person, but, but people still want to meet online. Um, and so that can be, there's all those intricate, unique, um, challenges respective to, um, your groups. I'm sure, you know, not enough time resources as always, um, you got to make do with what you have, um, and having to wear many hats. So I had to be, you know, do all the financial stuff and the event planning and the social media and research gathering and research analysis. Um, so, so some weeks were busier than others and I had phenomenal folks help as well. But of course, a lot of the work will also be on you as the, as the kind of principal investigator or the lead in, in a project. Um, some issues based, the very obvious direct impacts on tenants and people without shelter. We had um, a proposal for shelter in our area in South Etobicoke and there was a protest, right? And there were folks who did not want it um, and folks who did and the city kind of came up with, you know, they don't have enough funding to repair and create the shelter. And so that didn't happen. Um, the equity lens that overlaps can be limited and that's a little more intricate with the findings, which I won't go into, but, you know, it's gonna be unique. We can't have one sweeping policy change for everybody. There's definitely some approaches that would help a lot, but for example, um, the multi-tenant housing people, folks often say, this is a great thing that the city is doing. However, you know, I have a single father who lives in a, a shared with shared roommates and says, this is not appropriate because I have a child and I, I, I don't want roommates. Right. And so we kind of, we don't want to lose those stories too. So you're advocating on this diverse spectrum of equity um, needs, and you won't know that until you hear the stories. Um, and so what does that look like? And so you have to voice that and share that, that, um, you know, this is a, that, all of these different solutions. So the city, for example, has a variety of portfolios in terms of, um, you know, create TO and, and all these other um, approaches, community benefits and all that, um, Epic. And, and so those all are, and Mira and all those approach each sliver of the pie. And then the pie is obviously bigger and there's different solutions. So there isn't one sweeping thing. I mentioned the not in my backyard and yes, in my backyard, nimbyism, yimbyism. So we have some folks who get it 
let's build more shelters that's more safe for folks who are homeless or perhaps they might have addictions challenges they get it they're going to be able to thrive if they have a roof over their head um, it's safer for everybody and those who are more not in my backyard or or very much you know supply like let's build 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 but again what are we building and for who is it people are under housed specifically right we don't need more luxury units <laughs> we don't need 300 square foot um, units so there's a lot of this a lot of folks urban planning folks and different hats sharing their thoughts and so that is that can be a, a sea of challenges as well and then policy changes so you know in a recent one provincially the residential uh, tendency um, or the Rent Stabilization Act in November it was not passed to, to you know freeze rents and and we had that removed for new units in 2018 and that's been you know a driver of the doubling and tripling of rent and so there's a lot of policy pieces that's the ideal it's more more sustainable reach more people to have it in policy so that we're not repeating our efforts um, but we know that there's a lot of um, challenges in that arena alone next slide. I don't know if anybody had any questions about like challenges. I'm gonna dive into kind of the themes and recommendations. If you wanna drop it in the chat box, you're welcome to as well. So these are just the themes and recommendations from this study. Um, obviously this document could have been 300 pages, but I think it's about 40. <laughs> you, know, when, you know, when you're writing your paper, it could, you know, you wanna add more and more and more, but you know, there's a time limit and <laughs> gotta get it out there. So the three main themes was definitely the cost of living and an affordability the financialization of housing um, and the need for political involvement. So I think we'll see these considerably because there's sweeping uh, folks across um, the city and country globally advocating for this. Um, so we'll see hopefully more funding, you know, for co-ops and the federal, the feds had a survey wanting feedback on the financialization of housing, for example. And so hopefully, and but the issue is also that they're all in their own lane. So it can be difficult to ameliorate. So next slide. Um, so the solutions from the community members themselves, I'm not going to read through all of them, I kind of bucketed them qualitatively. So quality of life, advocacy and relationships, the financialization, equity and affordability, and then policy changes. So the two main ones was rent control and government to do this work, um, just by count. Um, so obviously not in any particular order, but those were the five buckets. And so with the equity, you can see the uniqueness of it, but the renter response, another uh, piece around the empathy based approach to not being able to provide the quality of life for my kids challenges the opportunities through life and the confidence it gives you. So I think, again, it, sometimes we tend to prioritize uh, certain people or groups or capitalism or financialization, right? It's you know, landlords have to pay their mortgage and corporations, you know, even though they're making more profits than ever, they need to pay their shareholders. So our priorities, I think that that ideology is hopefully shifting and it requires us because we are the creating new knowledge or criticizing the knowledge that exists out there. And so these stories um, are um, um, realizing that, right, I think in, in a more human way and, and sometimes they can get lost as well. Next slide. And these are just the five in a in a fancy graphic. <laughs> Next slide. So these, these are just the three main themes that are, um, I would say none of them are relatively new. I'm kind of repeating what um, a lot of folks have worked on and building off the work of others as well. So the three rent control redefine housing needs and reinvest in communities. So, you know, rent control is the most efficient way to address affordability is to preserve current stock, which no one seems to want to do, <laughs> right? For some, some obvious reasons and some not so obvious common sense reasons, right? So rent geared to income, rent and vacancy controls, right? Because then we're going to have a bigger social policy issues if, if our entire city becomes gentrified, right? Um, it's the few who are benefiting from that. And so, um, you know, rent evictions and financializations above guideline increases, um, redefine housing needs and that goes back to a little bit of the definitional piece and equity piece what is housing affordability or what is housing as a human right and for who lots of folks have vocalized what it is exactly and where we need to be you know i, I was at a conference um i think it was called new cities and there was a, an architect from mexico and she was just explaining um so beautifully how you know how they build houses it's it's part of the culture right 
what is the kitchen for and where should the window look out onto and how you sit and exist within a house, right? And, and how it's part of you. Um, and so we kind of just have commodified it, right? It's just, this is something that makes other people money. It's an investment property. We're so far removed that we, you know, we're neglecting the idea of communities and neighbors and, and everybody being able to thrive, right? And so that piece is, you know, a little more, uh, maybe somebody can uh, look into that as a study as well, right? Our cultural attitudes. Um, demographics and cultural needs have changed as well. You know, in our community, I, our demographics are generally not nothing too different from the city at large, but, um, you know, we do have baby boomers, for example. So what is housing going to look like right now? One of the, one of the interesting solutions that I stumbled on that you might know is the student and senior housing kind of home share, right? So there's a thorough application process, but they said somewhere near 5 million rooms are sitting empty across Ontario. So that's a lot. And that's obviously a solution for some, right? For students that would alleviate some of that stress. Um, and for, for, the, for those who, who desire to rent out and make some a little bit of income, that makes sense. Um, and so there are some creative ways, a little bit of stopgap solutions, but obviously I think no, it's going to be difficult to reverse rent. Um, um, although there are, there are people in some cities asking for that. Right. Um, and then reinvesting in communities. So housing, co cooperative housing, subsidies, repairs, we see that happening slowly, but surely. And just to prevent the precarity, right. And the negative impacts. I think we all know from uh, upstream approach, the long-term social and societal outcomes and health outcomes are far greater than the short-term benefits for the few, right? Next slide. Um, just repeating what I've already shared, but if anyone has questions, right? The definitional consistency, just for that shared language, but I think even the, even the way, um, you know, more homes built faster or affordable housing, and we talk about adequacy and suitability, not everyone knows that. And so, if someone's just, just saying more homes built faster, that's different than solving for the adequacy and suitability, which I mentioned with Mira, right? Um, or multi, sorry, multi-unit um, housing or room housing, room housing, housing rooms. And so the definitions, the problem, how the problem is defined determines a solution. And we want the community to come up with it too, which we can be a conduit for. Um, and you go back to the community and say, is this what we found, right? That whole process, um, really important. Case studies, we've had, tremendous kindness and help and generosity from groups across the city and they've written reports how can we do that we, we're definitely looking to bring land trust um, parkdale has had that kensington has had that um, and so on inclusionary zoning kind of a po long-term policy piece that would be great and then policy changes for example persons with disabilities right people on low income elderly and those who are more more vulnerable next slide This is the Wellesley Institute's Thriving in a City that I use a framework, um, the holistic approach. So person needs to thrive. I think we're this, we're a, a Toronto, not like, you know, we're not the, the most important city in the world, but we're a big <laughs> city, right? And so it matters in terms of how we, we can build what we envision to be the best that it can be or better. And so we shouldn't have to settle for less than that. And I think that requires everybody to have these conversations. Right? I think the pushback is very much, well, why should we fund this or why should we do that? Well, if we can shift the ideology into more of a caring and holistic approach, that would be really, really um, important in terms of the community-based approach, because that's what community is. That's what community is about. That's what community wants. And we're working with them, not above them and not um, without them. Next slide. Um, another kind of, I guess, uh, important point, but also a challenge is that sometimes, again, with wearing many hats, we have to realize that that there are these pillars of mobilization and change, right? Power and strength in numbers. Then there's the education piece, which we did a little bit about, a little bit of, in terms of Instagram and Twitter. And we we hosted National Housing Day events every year and workshops and capacity building workshops. So what's that ideological paradigm shift? How are we promoting the alternatives and sharing? Research is is a sliver as well, you know, research and research grants are finite and we can consolidate and use our skills and knowledge that we know how to shift some, some gears and support and provide that evidence and that factual piece. And then advocacy is everybody, hopefully, um, but sometimes we're expected to do everything, right? 
but I think the, sh the, um, the expectation should be that we can do a little more than just research, right? So, you know, I've talked to other researchers and, and some of them are really kind and, and open and, and connect and meet and share. And I have had other ones where it's just, no, what do you need? Okay, take care. Like they don't, they don't want to include me. They, I, they don't want me to promote them. <laughs> they don't want me to, you know, so this is, can be a lot too. And so I think there is an obligation for us to not just, you know, research and study um, uh, communities and benefit from it, which is, you know, that's what academia is, um, but working to include other things, even in small and important ways in the ways that you can. Next slide. So some of the community successes to date. So our partner has received two additional funding grants with, with our data and, and references and um, local groups have used our research, the churches around uh, capacity building. So, you know, we have the churches often uh, focusing on homelessness, right? Um, Cause that's, that's a source of uh, support. Um, because I had a network, a connection with Toronto Community Benefits Network. Um, we had a member create, um, a local uh, chapter of community benefits because I mentioned there's over 50,000 units. Can we, and the city just introduced also uh, a community benefits uh, portfolio. So how can we do that, right? We had that with Woodbine um, and I think Metrolinx and other, other places across the city, small and big, but maybe we could do housing as part of that as well. Um, we've helped with advocacy and education and mobilization where we can throughout the years with some of those uh, graphs and things that we shared. We we didn't uh, initiate, but we supported uh, very small in a small way, students advocacy. So we um, we might disaggregate some of our data, but most we had, I think maybe 40 out of the 277 surveys were students, but we did liaise with the College Student Alliance and they, they wrote a letter and we kind of helped uh, a little bit um, with, and they, they do a lot of advocacy as well, right? With, with MPs and MPPs. International students specifically, really dire because they are the most often, exploited, right? So not only are they paying four times the tuition, um, landlords, we've, we've heard from in our communities as well, and those who live near colleges, that it is more of a challenge, right? You're arriving in Canada, and it's become so much more difficult, and you're either many to a room, or you're with a stranger, and it's difficult to navigate and becomes more stressful. Um, we've hosted National Housing Day events and panels, and, and for the, sorry, the student piece, you'll hear that more and more in the news, folks sharing their, um, the challenges around that. National Housing Day, November 22nd. We've hosted panels and film viewings and events, um, capacity building workshops with um, Canadian Center for Human Rights and ACT ACTO, um, hosted the housing conference, um, and we're helping uh, support and provide insight with our second town hall with our elected officials, both uh, municipal, provincial, and federal at LAMP, with LAMP, LAMP is leading um, next week. So just continuing to support where we can in the ways that we can. And those were just some of those. Next. We created a research resource kit. And so we can send that to you. Um, it has a lot of different things. It has a report. It has all of the graphs individually and a and document explaining each of the graphs so they can use it in their research or their own reports or grants. We have a specific document on advocacy on all the key pieces happening municipally, provincially, and federally, and where they are. So if, if someone wanted to tackle something specific, for example, with a landlord tenant or, or um, any of the ones that I mentioned around um, rent evictions or, or the rent stabilization, what's happening, um, they can look at that. So just a one place uh, to gather some of that information. Next slide. And our team throughout the three years, so everyone was part-time, Jasmine Dew at LAMP, our partner, um, Natalie, research assistant, and, and, our, and the rest of the folks, Charlotte was the event management uh, placement student. So throughout the years, every year, that was a bit of a challenge too. I think, I don't know if anyone's ever hired, you know, students and outreach workers and it's, it, you know, it's one or two days a week. So that's, that was a challenge, right? Um, folks being able to stay longer term, not being able to, and our advisory committee. Um, so everyone's been really, really helpful. And that's it. And if you want to stay connected, please feel free to do so. Although, you know, the, the research project is ending. And so um, 
our partner will be continuing it with LAHAG, the um, local advocacy group. Any questions? <laughs> so any of that before we dive into the questions? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Salome. It's, it's really interesting to hear um, everything that's come out of your, your project. I think it's really tangible information to be able to further the advocacy that you've started within your group. Um, so we open up the floor. We only have about uh, kind of seven minutes or so for questions. So if folks have questions, please type them in the chat um, and we'll we'll get through as many as we can. Um, and I guess to start off the questions, something that came to my mind, Salome, is um, we've had a lot of discussions in recent webinars about this role of researcher advocate, where, you know, you've said as a researcher, we kind of have this obligation to do more than research. Um, so it, how do you define that in your mind? It sounds like in this project, you you really did play that role of researcher and advocate. Um, so what do you see kind of your responsibilities as in a project like this, where you do take on that advocacy piece? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, um, I will say it's probably, it seems a little more seamless, I would say in reflection, because I've been in the community for so long. And I'm also at a, at a stage in my career where it's, hey, I'm going to advocate and be vocal. And I maybe I don't care mm -hmm. about the outcomes. Um, so that's a bit of that confidence. So for those who are wondering, because I know it's very difficult, like if it was five years ago, it would be difficult to want to really push for all the things. And, and, and the, real, the reality is that we can't, but it mm -hmm. should be seamless. So you shouldn't have to be divided in terms of I'm a research person, and then I'm an advocate, and then I'm an educator, and then I'm this. It could be, it should be more seamless. And I think that's the value system of using a tool like this and being from community. And, and you might need to reflect on in what ways are you a ser a, of service to advocacy? In what ways do you hinder that so that you can navigate mm -hmm. that self-reflection a little better? And so, mm -hmm. for example, when the community asks for something or being proactive about producing something that might be useful so that the just a single document of here are all the things that are happening municipally, provincially, and federally so that we don't need to be you know, sharing articles every so often or having meetings and meetings and just talking about things. Here's some of the things mm -hmm. that we found validated. So being proactive where you can, advocating mm -hmm. for the community. If someone has, you know, is more vocal and has strong ideas about wanting something their way. You can, you have to be the strong facilitator to say, we're going to bring it back to the community. Let's do a survey. Let's get a doodle out. Let's hear everyone's opinion. Um, so those are the small and big ways that you can. And then there's obviously the due diligence of staying on top of as, as much up-to-date stuff as you can. Obviously I, there's so much with housing. I can't keep up with everything. Um, it, it would be a full-time job, but it's not. So um, giving yourself some grace in that way. But if you, if you don't have that self reflection or that praxis naturally, then you need someone to have that with maybe, right. Or you mm -hmm. need to be reading about it. So there's a great book called decolonizing methodologies so you need to unlearn some of the things that maybe you were taught or that you're mirroring in your colleagues or institutions to be able to be more community centered because advocacy mm -hmm. is also not above or for, we know there's that huge shift, right? With community development um, to social yeah. justice. We're not going to volunteer at a, at a food bank. We're going to question why the systems are in place that promote you know, housing is not for everybody, right? more food or poverty and so getting to the root of those pieces can really help um, bring together your advocacy and your work in a more authentic way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thanks for sharing it's it's neat to hear your insights on that um, we've heard you know a couple folks over this webinar series talk about what that role kind of means to them so interesting to hear your perspectives as well uh, and I see a question's come in from Rebecca, a uh, very complex sounding question. Uh, how can researcher advocates effectively support and or help staff on university campuses to support students who are experiencing homelessness? Is there ways in which everyone can work together for impact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually, a few months ago, liaised with our student union. And so I want to have those conversations and I might apply for a very small internal grant to continue that and help them. Um, and, you know, no one's kind of doing that, right? So, and or maybe they tried or maybe it's not, um, again, maybe we're siloed, I don't know. So yes, so obviously the immediate needs, wherever you can, connecting them with resources. I always share resources in all of my classes at the beginning as well. And if they need that specifically, 
knowing where that is is important. It's kind of that, you know, the social work hat or the, you know, community worker hat. Um, and then connecting the dots where you can. So I've had folks, for example, the international students and issues I've had, you know, someone who's from the community who shares, I'm paying other people's rent, I'm having to house people. They're, these issues are very dire. And so, um, and they want to mobilize and, and you can liaise and help them navigate what does advocacy look like, getting folks to share their stories, writing a letter, working with the student union, um, getting students to mobilize and uh, discuss in ways that they're comfortable doing so, which I think more and more before it was a little bit more, people are more hesitant. Um, and so those small and big ways and, and knowing that your own boundaries, right, you're not leading all of these different activities, you have to liaise. So I had to share with the individual, you know, here's a letter that we worked on, um, you know, do you want to get students to sign on or share their story so we can plug it in? What would you like to do? You need to also liaise with the student um, union, we might do a survey, maybe we could do some storytelling. But I'm, I won't be able to lead all of that, right? So, so knowing that, but you can still connect dots because there are a lot of people who are interested and they just don't know the steps, right? So, for example, you should be meeting with the local politicians. Why? Because international students contribute more to our GDP than domestic, and they graduate at a higher rate. So, those are those facts and stats that you can have liaise and let your politicians know. And so, just informing them of those advocacy pieces because those are not um, common knowledge either, right? So, there's small and big ways that you can just have a conversation without having to do all the work, but inspire and encourage folks because sometimes people don't know what to do or they feel helpless or hopeless. Yeah. I love that answer. And, and you know, we often talk about as a community-based researcher, you need to have skills beyond just research. You need to be a skilled facilitator because um, mm -hmm. usually throughout your research, you are facilitating those connections and partnerships and, and trying to connect those dots as you said it. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we'll close off the formal portion of, uh, of the e-learning event now just by saying thank you to folks. Um, I know not everyone can stay for the full two hours to join the live discussion. We really hope you can. It's a very impactful, interesting um, portion of the event, but in case anyone does need to leave now, we encourage you to stay in touch with us. You can sign up for our e-newsletter on our website to be informed of any other upcoming events. Um, Sarah can put the link in the chat for where you can find the e-newsletter sign up. Uh, and again, thank you. So we're going to stop the recording now. We thank everyone who was here with us today, everyone who asked a question. Uh, of course, Salome, our, our presenter, and, and thank you as well to anyone who might be watching this in the future online. Uh, we thank you for your, your interest and participation.